Thank you for the opportunity, preacher. It's, it's good to be in church tonight, isn't it? I know that there's a lot going on and people's minds are, and hearts are heavy and there's just a lot of noise out there. Now, I'm so glad that we can come into church and just get our focus right and concentrate on the main thing. And Brother Andrew, that was, that was an awesome message, man. That, that helped me. I like, and I like your mustache, amen. You look like Burt Reynolds, amen. But more than your mustache, I appreciate the message, man. I, I'm, I'm not joking around. It, it truly, truly helped me. If we could just do what Pastor John preached Sunday night. Just, just look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, my goodness, isn't that what we need to do tonight? And uh, so I want to draw your attention to the book of Acts, chapter number two. I do. Acts is my favorite New Testament book. And uh, we'll, we'll be in there, verse number 40. Uh, I went on vacation a few weeks ago as you're turning there. And um, I, now I, I feel like I'm, I'm living in a cave because we got rid of cable. I don't have cable. I don't have cable news. I got... I deleted my Twitter app, which is where I got most of my news. And so I've, I've just been completely oblivious to everything going on in the world. And guess what? It's, it's kind of been nice. Um, but I, I got back from vacation and, and I, Brother Mike Edwards um, came over to me and he started showing me pictures. He's like, can you believe, can you believe this? And I was like, oh my goodness. He was showing me pictures of, of fire damage. I was like, what in the world happened there? Where, where is that? He said, you didn't hear? And he, he started talking about the, the fires in, in Hawaii. How many saw the, the horrible wildfires over there in Hawaii? I was like, oh, my goodness. This is, this is horrible. This is horrible. And, um, and uh, um, I did a little bit more research. What a, what a devastating uh, disaster that was. And... Um, so many people dying, and I, I think the, the death toll right now is 115 with hundreds more missing. Um, that fire swept in there, and uh, the more research that I did on it, it was, it was just so sad to see, but there was a, a lot of sketchy things going on too, like uh, people trying to escape and them not, you know, blocking off roads and, and certain properties not, not having any damage at all while other properties were just completely engulfed in flames. I mean, we're talking about cars that were literally melted by this fire. And uh, I, I started watching the interviews of, of uh, the natives there and, and the locals there that, that had to go through that. And they were talking about the travesty of the whole thing. And a lot of them talked about different elements of that fire, but all of them talked about the exact same thing that they all encountered in that fire. They said that not once did anyone give them a warning about what was taking place. And if you... If you watched the, the, the news and the, uh, uh, the press conferences and everything, they had sirens all along that coast, all along that coast that was, that was there for natural disasters and not once did they sound off those sirens. The people there said, had they had you know, sounded off a warning, had the law enforcement come and said that you need to evacuate, had they have done that, many of people would have got out of that fire. And I got to thinking about that. And it's really nice to come into church and just simplify everything. It's a lot of hurting. I, my mom's in the hospital but to be able to, with all of the noise and, and all of the distractions, to be able to simplify what's going on in this world. And it's really simple. Amen. Jesus is coming back and many 
are not ready. And God has commissioned the church with the responsibility, more so than the responsibility, the honor to sound off the warning to this lost and dying world. Now, I want to remind you what the Apostle Paul said is getting ready to happen. He talks about the Lord Jesus in 2 Thessalonians, and he says, When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, listen to this, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. For those who have not obeyed the gospel, for those who have not submitted to Jesus Christ and him as Lord, for them who have rejected his his, uh, free gift of salvation, that is their imminent, looming future. And they might enter into that unrepentant. They might enter into that unforgiving They might enter into that ungodly, but may they not enter into destruction unwarned. We have to sound the alarm, church. We have to to call out the warning to this lost and dying world. People say, oh, that's not loving. You've got to be compassionate. The most loving and compassionate thing that the church of the living God can do is to tell this lost and dying world that there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. It's the most loving thing you can do. Have we not been commissioned with that ministry? Oh, it's easy to tell someone, oh, God loves you. Oh, it's easy to tell someone about God's grace and God's mercy. And yes, God is full of love and God is full of grace and God is full of mercy. But God is also holy and he's angry at sin. And sin cannot go unpunished. He's a righteous God. He's a just God. And all of these people who are so happy in their sin, so blinded by the darkness, they are headed towards that everlasting fire. And we must warn them to turn away and to receive the gospel. What Andrew preached, that is the answer, the death, the burial, the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. I thought back and this thing of warning is a godly thing. In Genesis chapter number 2, God gives the first warning. Oh, you can eat of these trees, but the day that you eat of that tree thereof, here's the warning, ye shall surely die. In Hebrews chapter 11, when, 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 when the world got so wicked that God had to destroy it, the Bible says Noah being warned of God. And the Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. God sent those two angels into the city of Sodom. Why? To warn Lot and to rescue Lot. Isaiah was called and commissioned to this ministry of warning. Jeremiah was commissioned. Ezekiel was commissioned. Joel warned about the day of the Lord. Jonah was sent into that Assyrian city called Nineveh to warn them if they did not repent, they would be destroyed. From the very beginning, it is the call of righteous people to give a warning, not because we hate the world, but because we love them and we want them to be saved. So let's focus our attention tonight. Let's get off all the distractions. And let's look at this passage here in Acts chapter number 2. 
This is the end of that great sermon on the day of Pentecost. He had ended it. He had told them to repent. And many of them did. And then he says this in verse number 40. If you're there, say amen. amen. And with many other words. Have you ever heard a preacher do that? Quit preaching and then start preaching again. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, look at this. I think this is amazing, the way God worded this. Save yourselves. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So tonight I want to preach on that thought. Save yourselves. Before I dive into it, Preacher Ray, would you please stand and pray for me as I begin to preach? Yes. Yes. Intercession for us this evening. Amen. Have your way now, Lord. Bless my father. And we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Those Hawaiian fires, at the press conference, the guy said, the official who was in charge of sounding off the siren, he said, he gave the reason why he didn't sound off the siren. And it was... It goes as this, and everybody said it's, it's complete nonsense, but this was the excuse that he gave. He said that that siren is used mostly for tsunamis, and we were worried that if we sounded that siren, that people, instead of going towards the ocean, would go away from the ocean and go into, um, into the fire, go back into the island. So in essence, what that guy was saying is, I'm afraid to sound off the warning because of the way people would react. How many of you have that uh, that, that fear in your heart? You ever been afraid to, to tell someone about Jesus, to tell someone about their eternity, but yet you did not. You muzzled yourself because you were afraid of the way that they would react. You are afraid of what they might say or what they might think. And so you might be in here tonight and you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Chad, I'm just not wired that way. I ju- I, I'm just not one to, to open up my mouth and, and to tell someone about Jesus. I'll leave that to someone else. I just don't have that gift. I'm just not capable of that. And sir, man, may I just tell you here tonight that you are not underestimating yourself when you say that. You are underestimating the Holy Spirit of God. That's who you are underestimating. Because I want to look first at the messenger of God that God is using here. Look at what it says in verse 40. And with many other words did he... Who is the he in this passage of scripture? It's none other than Simon Peter. He is the one that is preaching at the day of Pentecost who just weeks prior to this denied the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing special about Simon Peter. He didn't have a master's degree in theology. He didn't have a doctorate degree. He didn't even have a bachelor's degree. Jesus found him along the shores of the of Sea of Galilee. He was a fisherman. He had a language problem. He had an attitude problem. There was nothing 
extraordinary about Simon Peter. But something very specific, something very magnificent happened at the beginning of this chapter. The Holy Spirit of God came as a mighty rushing wind. And it said that the 11 were filled with the Holy Ghost of Almighty God. It's not about you. It wasn't about Peter. It's not about me. The Holy Spirit of God can empower you to do things you never dreamed you could do. So you say, here's the excuse. I'm not wired that way. I'm an introvert. I just can't talk to people about that. You're not underestimating yourself. You're underestimating the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit of God, when you get filled with that Holy Spirit of God and you start learning about the Bible and growing more in your faith, you can't help but tell others about it. You can't help but sound off the warning to this lost and dying world that Jesus saves. Messenger was Peter. What did he do? Verse number 14, at the very beginning of this address, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, He stood and he spoke. So much for lifestyle evangelism. It says, oh, you don't need to actually say the words. You just live it and people will look at you and your life and how you're living. Oh, I agree that living it is very important, but I also believe speaking it is very important. He told us to go, not just live it, but he told us to preach it. He told us to teach it. He told us to open up our mouths and let words come out and to tell this lost and dying world what they need to hear. You say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. If you got the Holy Spirit of God in you, you can do it. Get, a, get rid of the excuses. L -l -l just try it. Just once. Try God. Try him. I can guarantee you, you are not going to be disappointed. And you're going to be amazed at, at the work the Holy Spirit can do in your life when you talk to someone about the Lord. So I see this messenger of God. There's nothing special about him. And secondly, I see this. I see the message of God. The message is, it was, was simple, and I, th I, think it's, I think it's so amazing the way it's phrased. He says this, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, what does that word untoward mean? Well, you take the word un, which means not, Take the word toward, and that means in the direction of. These people were not in the direction of the Lord. It's pretty simple. A synonym of it would be a crooked generation, a wicked generation, an ungodly generation. And so Simon Peter, and you got to imagine this. you got to imagine the boldness and the courage of Simon Peter. This crowd that just crucified his Savior a little over a month uh, prior to this event, he is preaching to them the exact same message. Can you imagine the boldness and courage of, the Simon, of Simon Peter getting up and proclaiming the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? And he does it with the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit of God. And he looks to that crowd and he says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now that sounds very familiar talk to me. Because I know another man that spoke of a few generations. A man that Simon Peter walked with for three and a half years. That man would look at that generation and he would say things like this. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You remember that? 
There's a, there's a man who said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? There's a man that said, oh, generation of vipers. A man who said, and when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. That is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon Peter is preaching to the same crowd and he's preaching the same message that he learned from the master teacher himself, Jesus. If Jesus would look at it in that crowd and call them untoward, call them wicked, call them adulterous, you can't say it's ungodly. You can't say that it's sweet. You can't say that it's unkind. No, it's the, the greatest responsibility. It's the greatest thing anyone can ever do is to tell someone that they're lost and they need Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus warned of hell more than he talked about heaven. At least 20 times he mentioned fire as it related to hell. Jesus said, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. He said, and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. <laughs> How many think that Jesus was a, a hell fire and brimstone preacher? Yes, he, he ate with sinners, but he wasn't eating with them to justify and condone them, their sin. No, he was eating with them to show them a better way, a better life, which is life eternal. Amen. So we see the message, save yourselves. Yes, sir. Not save yourselves from sin. You can't do that. Not save yourselves from hell. You can't do that. But what he is doing here is he is telling this crowd, you have a choice. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You have a choice. You can, you can identify with this group and with this generation if you want to. Oh, but I'm telling you, just as Jesus told you, if you follow down this path and you identify with this generation and you go along with what they're doing, it's only going to lead to destruction. Save yourselves from that. The message of Simon Peter was not save yourselves from sin. No, you can't do that. For by grace are you saved. Uh, by, for by grace are you saved. And that not of what? Yourselves. You can't save yourself. What he's saying is you have a choice right now to go along with that generation or turn from it to a holy God who will wrap you in his loving arms and forgive you and save you and give you eternal life. You have a choice. You have a choice in here tonight. The message is clear. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And then we see this, which is amazing. We see the move of God. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word. Can I say this, that Jesus brings gladness? He brings fulfillment. He brings joy. When you receive him, when you repent, and you see yourself for who you are, a sinner, and you turn to him for salvation, you'll be filled with the greatest joy that you could ever experience. You will experience gladness like no liquor bottle could ever give you, no drug, no escapade, no, no nothing can ever give you the amount of fulfillment that you can find in Jesus Christ. It says this, then they 
that gladly received his word. They were baptized. And the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. But what if Simon Peter had not have sounded off the warning? If you notice, he crowned the sermon at Pentecost right there at the edge of the temple wall, right there on Solomon's porch where we were, preacher, looking out into the masses. He sounded off the alarm, the warning that there is a way that leads to destruction. And and we see it everywhere. For those that were there last night, you saw it. You saw people who were completely blinded. And that enjoy it that enjoy the sin and ungodliness and wickedness of this world. I'm not not angry. I'm sad for them. The wrath of God is revealed unto them. They must be warned. This lost and dying world must be warned. And it's not just Pastor John's responsibility. It's not the deacon's responsibility. It is the responsibility of the church. I want to ask you this question. No man knoweth the day or the hour. How many believe Jesus is coming back real soon? He's coming back soon. I want you to think for a moment. What if we knew that Jesus was coming back exactly one week from now? Exactly one week. So this time next week, Jesus is coming back. We don't know that. But what if he was? And what if you knew? How would you spend that next week? next few minutes, the next few hours, next few days. I'd hope that you wouldn't waste it on Facebook. I hope that you wouldn't waste it on Twitter. I tell you what I would try to do is I would try to reach that uncle that I know does not know, that I know is lost and on his way to hell. Try to reach that cousin who has the form of godliness but denies the power thereof. Yeah, it takes a little bit of boldness. It takes a little, it takes a little bit of courage, yeah. It takes a little bit of confrontation. But we can't allow these people to, to blindly enter into the gates of hell without being warned. Amen. We will have blood on our hands. And so it's pretty simple tonight. Jesus is coming back real soon. And he's given us the ministry to warn this world about his coming. First time he came as a little baby. But the next time he comes, a sword is going to proceed out of his mouth. And he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. And he's going to take vengeance on this earth. I've slacked off in my burden for the lost. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to that altar and I'm going to pray. Because I need to be up in that altar more than anybody tonight. But here's the invitation. How many of you... Because of all the noise and distractions of the world, maybe just the experiences of life that have weighing you down, the burdens, you've lost your burden for what really matters. And you need to just refire. You need to, you need to commit to, to telling this lost world that Jesus saves. 
I'm going to commit to that tonight, and I pray that you do as well. And if anyone is in here tonight, you've been warned. If you do not know the Lord, you know what your future is. But that doesn't have to be your future. We have a God that can change your future. If you just come to him in faith, believing. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, I pray that you bless this time of invitation. I pray that you help us to get a burden, to pass out tracts, to tell our lost loved ones about you. I pray that we would just get revived tonight and fired up to serve you. I thank you so much for your word. And I pray that you help us, enable us, empower us to do your work. In Jesus' name I pray.